uh, at this platform. There is a lot of people anticipating to hear from you. And as you can see, Ethiopia has multiple complex problem and we hope national dialogue is the key to moving forward. Uh, let me introduce Suzanne Stigan from USIP, an expert on national dialogue. Today, she would uh, give us the principle of national dialogue in a framework, an outline of framework um, that would could be used to apply to Ethiopia's situation. We in fact had a scholar from uh, Oromia who presented um, on a similar case. So he's, he's staying behind to listen to this, uh, your talk. So uh, with that being said, welcome to Oromo Studies Association. The floor is, is yours. Thank you, Dr. Avisa, and thanks to everybody for inviting me today. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Susan Stigant. Uh, I'm the Director of Africa Programs at the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, for those not familiar, USIP is an independent federal institute established by the United States Congress um, almost 40 years ago uh, with a mandate and a mission to support the prevention resolution of violent conflict around the world. Uh, so we do our work independently um, and we have that very specific mandate and relationship with, with the United States Congress. Um, I'm really pleased to join you today um, and to share a little bit about um, some research and practice uh, that we have been looking at uh, for the past almost 10 years on the question of national dialogue processes. Um, what, I'll, what I'll say today is not specific to Ethiopia, but is based on a publication called National Dialogues in Peacebuilding and Transitions, Creativity and Adaptive Thinking. And I hope that by setting out the framework um, and some reflections on the six case studies that, that we examined, um, that it will spark some further questions and, and conversations and, and hopefully some further discussion uh, between uh, members of the Oromo Studies Association and, and the United States Institute of Peace. So let me just start by saying that um, national dialogues in many ways have, have shown up um, in the media and in peace processes around the world and became almost the new shiny object and the answer to the very complicated, complex, often painful questions of, of violent conflict. And at their very best, um, we know that these, these processes can hold the promise of adding momentum to transforming conflict in an inclusive, sustainable way. Uh, if we look at national dialogues that have taken place in the past, some have brought together stakeholder groups, facilitated open and genuine discussion on the sources of a country's conflict and the future that people hope for it to have. Um, they have explored the legacy of violence for individuals, communities, the country, and they've helped to forge consensus on policy, legislative and constitutional arrangements. One of the, the ways that national dialogues have, have been seen as attractive is that they offer a way to bring in groups that have been previously excluded from negotiating tables and to play a part and add their voices, their views, their priorities, their hopes, their concerns about the country's future. And, and this, this idea of, of leveling the playing field, of bringing in the diverse set of voices um, makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, and it also points to some of the evidence that we know that inclusion, um, or maybe said the other way, that exclusion ultimately undermines the sustainability of peace agreements. Another reason that national dialogues have been, um, been popular and looked to is because of local ownership. Uh, we know that from other peace processes that externally driven agreements are often criticized for a very good reason for being disconnected from the realities in a country. And they can be signed, but then met with resentment from citizens and communities and groups who feel that they were not consulted. And we know that leaders sign peace agreements, but it is for the people to implement them. And at their very best, national dialogues can provide a bridge for, for exactly this. A national dialogue could also offer opportunities for public participation um, and for delegates or participants to represent a broader range of society. And as a result, 
can help to lead to agreements and solutions that are rooted in the country and backed by a broader consensus. Now, this, um, this ideal is not always achieved in national dialogues. And I will say at the front, while this is a topic that I study and that I've advised on, um, I'm under no illusion that national dialogues are the right answer for, for every challenge or every conflict. Um, we also know that national dialogues have been used by governments to continue power um, without having credible elections or um, to, to defer core decisions. Um, and in, in, in some cases, they've in fact been anti-democratic um, and have helped to uh, continue polarization, divisions, and power inequities in a country. So just, just like not all peace negotiations are, are good for peace, not all national dialogues are not necessarily good for sustainable peace either. So let me um, tell you just a little bit about how we, we undertook this research and why. Um, this goes back to 2013, 2014, and USIP was approached by partners and colleagues from Libya to Sudan to advise and support on the development of national dialogues in their countries. And we looked around the Institute and we asked ourselves whether we had expertise to actually do that. Um, we, we had experience on constitution making, we had experience in mediation, in facilitation, in negotiation, in dialogues, um, but we weren't quite sure whether that added up to what people were talking about in terms of national dialogue. We also hadn't done a critical reflection about under what conditions, under what format, under what structures would national dialogues actually contribute to helping to end violence, strengthen the relationship between citizens and their government, and help to forge towards a sustainable, inclusive, and lasting peace. And so we made the decision to look at six case studies of relatively recent, at the time, national dialogue processes, um, and to try to understand their, their shape and form, um, the, the broad contours, the decisions that those who sought to establish and run national dialogues and those who sought to support them either with assistance or diplomatic engagement uh, and those who sought to undermine them. What, what were those dynamics and what were some of the key questions that needed to be considered as well as the lessons that could be drawn from those. So we looked at six case studies that I'll, I'll draw from today, uh, Kenya, Tunisia, Central African Republic, Lebanon, Senegal, and Yemen. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, and so let me tell you just a little bit about how we selected those. Um, we realized that we needed to develop a definition um, because the, the cases that I just laid out look quite different in their shape, form, structure, and objectives. And so our definition had three parts to it. One, a national dialogue had to have an agenda that includes multiple questions and issues driving conflict. That is not a single issue dialogue, such as a national dialogue on environmental policy, or a national dialogue on transitional justice, or a national dialogue on women's inclusion and participation. So we were looking specifically at national dialogues that had several agenda items. Our second aspect of the definition um, was that the process needed to have support of what we called a credible coalition of stakeholders, individuals who are both within and outside of government or the current political structure. Um, and as a result, that the national dialogue would have a reasonable chance of being implemented. Um, as I think back, we might have also said that this credible coalition uh, would represent at least a political agreement a political settlement that a national dialogue, um, its agenda and key dimensions were something that had commitment from key political decision makers and those who had the ability to exercise violence and force in the country. The third part of our definition um, was that the national di dialogue had to take place in a platform outside of the existing permanent institutions of the government. Um, and that this specifically took place because those institutions were either unwilling, unable, or lacked the necessary credibility and legitimacy to convene a broad-based dialogue. Now, that, that was the definition we used. Um, other scholars have looked at this and have used slightly different definitions. 
um, which I'll just I'll share one of those with you um, to say that national dialogue itself as a as a term uh, is not something that is fixed or or fully agreed. Um, so this other one comes from a publication called The Promise and Perils of National Dialogue by Katia Papiagiani. Um, and she defines national dialogue as inclusive negotiation processes designed to expand participation in political transitions beyond the incumbent elites to a wide array of political, military, and in some cases, civil society groups. Um, so I think uh, one of one of the first points that I, I would want to raise for your attention is that national dialogues in many ways, uh, they have some key uh, structures, some key characteristics, uh, but there's also an opportunity for each country to shape the form of the national dialogue to fit to the need and purpose um, that it is seeking to address. So let me just spend a very brief moment to talk to, to outline the cases that we looked at, um, because all of the countries that I mentioned have gone through various negotiations and dialogues over time. Um, and I'm happy to share the link to, to the publication um, in the, the chat a bit later, um, but invite you to take a look. Each of the case studies um, is, is written out in full form. They were all developed in partnership uh, with national uh, researchers or organizations or through um, consultations led by our colleagues who worked in or on the country, um, because we wanted to not just have a fully academic understanding, we wanted to have a practical understanding of what were the questions that people had to grapple with, what were the diverging sets of, of interests and views, uh, and what were some of the perspectives of people who were insiders, not just people who are outside. Um, so in Central Africa, Central African Republic, the May 2015 Bangui Forum brought together approximately 800 Central Africans to discuss the root causes of their country's recent civil war and to agree on political solutions to complete the transitional period. This was also sequenced with ceasefire um, discussion and preceded uh, a set of elections. In Kenya, um, the violence that took place following the December 2007 elections motivated the African Union to convene the country's two leading political parties for the Kenya National Dialogue and Reconciliation. And this came out with a, a four agenda political agreement that set forth, again, a, a transition process leading into both a new constitution um, and then subsequent elections. In Lebanon, um, an elite level national dialogue in both 2006 and from 2008 to 2012 sought to bridge divides between the country's two main political factions and to break the deadlock on very complicated governance and power sharing issues. In Senegal, um, in 2008, 2009, the Assis Nationale were convened by opposition political leaders and prominent civil society members as the country um, was going through a deepening polarization amid suspicions that President Wad would attempt to secure a third term. Uh, so it was not initiated by the government itself, it was initiated by, by political opposition groups and, and in fact resulted in a charter that came, became the basis of the, the political platform for some of those opposition groups that, that ran together and subsequently became the government in those next elections. And the last two, which are maybe the most, um, some of the most uh, visible, uh, Tunisia's national dialogue was organized by four significant civil society organizations known as the Quartet, um, who received the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize for, for their work. Um, the Quartet convened political party leaders who sele successfully selected a caretaker government, agreed on a constitution, uh, sent it to the National Constituent Assembly for uh, its approval and set a timetable for elections. And finally, Yemen's National Dialogue Conference, um, which took place between 2013 and 2014, um, was initially established in the 2011 Gulf Cooperation Council Agreement that paved the way for President Saleh to leave power following the Arab Spring protests. Yemen's National Dialogue Conference convened 565 delegates in Sana'a for 10 months of deliberations, resulted in some 
1,800 recommendations and resolutions. Um, and as we all know, unfortunately, uh, did not manage to resolve or get agreement on some of those core issues, um, and that the country has has remained uh, in serious both political, military conflict and, and humanitarian crisis with some of those very complicated outstanding issues. So just, just with that very quick walkthrough of six different experiences of national dialogue in the last, in the last decade and a half, um, you can see that these dialogues range broadly on the number of delegates, the degree of inclusion, the intensity of the violence that took place before the national dialogue itself, or even continued while the national dialogue was taking place. They also range very broadly in terms of international involvement. So you can see that in the case of the Yemen National Dialogue, there was significant international involvement, both from the region um, and from the broader international community. In Senegal, the Assis Nationale was entirely financed by Senegalese. Uh, it was chaired by a prominent member who had served as the, the head of UNESCO, a Senegalese leader, um, and was really nationally led um, and owned. The dialogues also ranged considerably in terms of sequencing and the relationship of the national dialogue to other steps in a peace agreement or the transition. And we look particularly at questions about ceasefires and cessation of hostilities, the question of constitutional arrangements. Does the national dialogue make decisions that then are binding on a future constitution or do they set forward options for that? Um, and where they fit in terms of an election process itself. Um, so maybe let me just spend a few minutes on, on some of the, the core considerations and the pillars that we really look at um, in the publication. Um, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the, the last chapter, which um, we, wanted, we wanted this to be really accessible and usable for practitioners, people who are thinking about and grappling with the, the dilemmas and decisions around national dialogue. And so the last chapter is, is actually organized in a way that looks across uh, these various dimensions that I'll touch on and sets forward a set of questions for consideration. Um, and we're not trying to take the lazy way out there. Um, we really do see that the, the fundamental decision-making about the shape and form and the timing and the size and the agenda and public participation and decision-making in the national dialogue is something that needs to be negotiated and discussed among those who are leading it and who will be most impacted by the outcomes of, of the dialogue. So, so I'll run, I'll run through, through these um, very briefly just, just to outline and um, hope that we can have a chance to, to continue the conversation. So, so the first dimension that we looked at was the context and the purpose. And so this, this maybe seems to be go, go without saying, but the context in which the dialogue starts influences its design. Another way of saying that is there is no way to take off the shelf what a national dialogue process needs to look like without understanding what has driven the conflict or the violence in the country, what objective the national dialogue seeks, seeks to, to answer and to achieve, and what are, are the particular dynamics that will shape the dialogue over time. And, and so some of the questions that, that we've seen that people have to grapple with is, is the context ripe? for a dialogue? Is there a ceasefire? Have stakeholder groups demonstrated a genuine commitment? Are there preconditions for participation? Can those be met without alienating other groups? Um, the, a very fundamental question, what problem is the national dialogue aiming to solve? In the case of Tunisia, there was a very specific four-point agenda that had to be agreed. In Kenya, uh, it was clear that there needed to be an agreement to end the violence, facilitate humanitarian access, and develop a roadmap going forward for the country's broader transition. In Yemen, the question was incredibly broad, um, thinking about both uh, addressing crimes of the past and developing a roadmap forward and informing constitution making. But this is, this is a very fundamental and early question that I think needs to be answered. And finally, what's, what is the relationship between the dialogue and a peace process if there is a separate peace process? Um, and and how, how would those processes interconnect, intersect at different points? 
The second dimension that, that we looked at and we drew out across all of the six case studies was establishment and mandate. So the mandate of a national dialogue could be anchored in both a formal agreement or an informal agreement. There could be international involvement or without international involvement. So for example, the Lebanese national dialogues came ha, actually had their mandates from different sources. So same country, but different sources. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in Yemen, the mandate came initially from the Gulf Cooperation Council initiative. Um, in, in Central African Republic, uh, the Bangui Forum was the third phase in the peace process that had been led by the Economic Community of Central African States, ECAS. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in Kenya, the mandate came from the African Union um, and the Peace and Security Council mandate that was received. Sometimes we get a little bit caught up in, in legal mandates, and these are, these are absolutely important questions, as, as any of the, the lawyers who are part of this conversation will tell you. We also wanted to talk about mandate in terms of political mandate. Um, and so, so some of the questions that I think are important to consider are, are, are the necessary stakeholders involved in negotiating the mandate? If not, can their ideas and their concerns and their interests be brought in over time? Um, there are several cases where, where there are groups, um, including in, in the Yemen National Dialogue and, um, and even in, in Senegal, who were not willing to participate early on, um, but there were quiet conversations that allowed their concerns to be brought into the, into the negotiations themselves. Um, another question to consider is whether the mandate leverages the necessary international engagement and can also help to buffer from unconstructive engagement from, from those outside of the country. If, if a dialogue has a mandate domestically from the country itself, is that seen as sufficiently neutral? If not, is it possible to mitigate that question by the selection of a preparatory committee or a facilitation team? And then finally, does, does the roadmap include commitments and structures to ensure that the dialogue outcomes are carried forward and implemented? I'll come back to that, that at the very end. Um, but one of the things that we saw um, as being incredibly important is an understanding and commitment at the beginning, at the very establishment of the national dialogue about what the outcomes would, would do, what, what they would hold in terms of power and source and credibility and how they would carry forward. The third dimension that we look at is, it relates to the preparatory phase. Um, I think when we say national dialogue, everybody imagines uh, a very large conference, either under a tent or under a tree or in a, in a big hotel or convention center. Um, and I think there's less attention and visibility about all of the quiet steps um, that need to take place leading up to that. And there are preparatory aspects that are political in terms of the actual negotiations. Um, so in the case of Tunisia, um, there, it was the, the sh there was shuttle diplomacy that was led by the quartet in order to se secure agreement on their own mandate and what the dialogue would be. That, that's not as, as well known, or you, you won't see those pictures necessarily um, in our report or, or in other reports. Um, and so there's, there's that, that level of the preparations that needs to take place. There's also a really important role for some of the, the logistics preparations, the consultation, educating the public about what they should expect in the dialogue and what the dialogue cannot achieve. Um, there are very real financial needs in order for, to carry out a national dialogue. And so identifying funding and, and having then the infrastructure, the administrative capacity to, to, to use that funding um, in a responsible way um, is another part that is sometimes forgotten. We also saw that um, many of the dialogues, especially the larger dialogues, um, considered undertaking consultations beforehand. So the Bangui Forum was actually preceded by a series of popular consultations that was, it was actually one of the first times in a structured way that national decision makers went out to communities and asked people their views and then brought that into the national conversation. Um, in other instances, I think there's also been important preparation that's taken place in terms of developing capacity, strengthening capacity for facilitation, for mediation. So imagine that you get either eight or 500 people into a room 
to talk about some of the most dividing, polarizing, painful issues um, for countries and communities and individuals, um, there needs to be preparation and planning to know how to facilitate that conversation and how, and how to carry it forward. So, so in many ways, the, the way that the preparatory phase takes place, the time that's invested in that um, is, is, a, is an absolutely critical investment um, leading into the dialogue process itself. So the fourth dimension that we looked at is the agenda. Um, often when we say national dialogue, people imagine a lot of delegates who, who tackle quite a broad, open, extensive agenda. And what we saw in, in our case studies is that it really ranged. Um, as I said before, Tunisia and, Ken and Kenya had relatively um, delineated specific agenda items that were negotiated beforehand and agreed. Uh, in the case of Yemen, the dialogue was very wide ranging. Um, and so this, this, is a com this is a conversation and, des and a decision that each country has to undertake. Next, we looked at the question of delegates. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, the, the dialogues that we looked at ranged from eight, um, eight people uh, with two four-person negotiating teams in Kenya uh, to the size of the Yemen National Dialogue Forum, which, which was over 500 people. And, and again, this is a, an instance where understanding the objective of the dialogue, uh, the importance of thinking through different tables and opportunities for, for participation um, requires significant consideration, likely consultation, and at some stage negotiation between those who, who are in political power. Um, there's there's often uh, a belief that there are, uh, there can be a trade off between the size and the efficiency. Um, so with a large number of delegates, it's hard to make decisions quickly. But with a smaller number of delegates, it's much harder to reflect the diverse and often diverging views that exist. So what we found is that often um, in larger dialogues, uh, there's a need to structure the conversation differently, um, to have subcommittees or, um, or smaller discussion groups that are based on thematic issues. Uh, this was very much the case um, in Yemen, also in Senegal, whereas in the smaller ones, um, everybody involved uh, participates in each of the conversations. The next dimension that we looked at was the question of public participation. And I think this is another one where sometimes um, the idea of national dialogue, people imagine that everybody will have a seat at the table. Um, and we often make the mistake of assuming that there is one table. Uh, and what we've seen is that public participation can look quite different in different instances. So in, in the case of Kenya with again, small negotiating team, uh, it was really the mediators who took the responsibility of consulting with civil society and bringing their perspectives into the discussion and the negotiations. There weren't um, <clears throat> direct opportunities for broader conversation and participation in, in the negotiations themselves. Uh, in the case of the Bangui Forum, as I mentioned, there were a series of, of popular consultations that took place beforehand. There was also um, regular briefing that came out of the, the dialogue process itself. And in Yemen, um, there were several initiatives that took place to, to hold parallel conversations that were then fed to the delegates uh, to bring into, into the National Dialogue Conference the formal proceedings. There were also civic education campaigns that took place, um, regular press briefings. Um, and, and in other dialogues, um, there, have, there have even been a set of responsibilities articulated for the de delegates to go back to their constituency, whether that's a geographic, a political, or some other social or political group, to both update and hear the perspective of those who are not sitting in the room, but have a view and concern with what the outcome would look like. The next um, aspect that we looked at was the question of structure and decision-making. So as you would expect, smaller national dialogues um, are generally more streamlined, <clears throat> whereas larger ones um, have different modes of decision-making and, and support structures. Um, so what, what we found in, in all of this is that, so for example, um, if we look at Yemen with the 565 delegates, 
there were nine different subcommittees that made recommendations and sent them to the plenary for approval. Um, at both levels, a 90% vote was required for decisions to be taken. If this was not possible, then there were issues that were sent to what was called the consensus committee, which would deliberate on the range of views and propose a solution. And then the consensus proposal could be passed by 75% of the plenary. Now, I, I don't expect that you would remember all of these details, but just to say that with, with a large, a large uh, national dialogue, there's a need to have smaller venues to identify clear deadlock breaking mechanisms um, and to have predictable rules of decision making. Um, with a smaller uh, national dialogue, there still needs to be agreement on how decisions will be made and channels if agreement cannot be reached. Um, but this is this is something that also needs to be developed and designed. Often this is, is done as part of the preparatory phase and then put into practice and, and very often adapted as needed over time. And so the three last dimensions that we looked at were facilitation and convening, international involvement, and then the results and implementation. On facilitation and convening, uh, we looked specifically at who was, was seen as the chair of the national dialogue and who had um, who was the convening entity to take the, the process forward. We saw that um, the majority were national in nature. So in Tunisia, the quartet, in Senegal, um, the former UNESCO director general, um, who is a respected Senegalese, um, in Yemen, the uh, President Hadi, the interim, and then um, subsequently elected president. And, and in Lebanon, the Speaker of Parliament was, was the convener initially. Um, and in the 2008 to 2012, the president um, served that role. In other instances, such as the Central African Republic, it's been more hybrid in nature. Um, and so uh, for, for Central African Republic's Bangui Forum, the UN Special Representative um, worked jointly with two national vice chairs. Um, and this was seen as, as really necessary to give the weight of, of international involvement and to address some of the polarization that existed um, and balance out the, the different interests. Um, and then in Kenya, it was it was very much the AU panel of eminent African personalities who who were who were the conveners. But the question of facilitation um, goes beyond just the chair um, or or the actual entity that's convening. It also includes how specific subcommittee conversations will be will be managed. Um, and I would draw your attention to um, to Lebanon um, as particularly interesting here, um, because I think there was there was an effort to to ensure that people who had developed uh, professional facilitation skills um, were present and were helping to facilitate those complicated and difficult conversations. This was also the case in Yemen, and so some of the early decisions that have to be made in preparations is, is what are those resources that are needed? What is the expertise that's needed in the room, both on, on topics, um, as well as how to have the conversation, how to reach agreement, or how to, how to resolve when, when agreement can't be reached. In terms of international involvement um, and influence, um, the level of international support varies across the dialogues that we looked at. Um, in Tunisia, the formal international involvement was minimal, but certainly regional dynamics played into the decision for the dialogue to be held. Um, and the diplomatic community remained very active in supporting the work of the quartet. Uh, in Kenya, Central African Republic, and Yemen, the national dialogues would, would not likely have taken place without heavy international involvement. Senegal, as I mentioned earlier, is quite a contrast. Um, where a large, complex national dialogue was, was neither significantly influenced by regional dynamics nor heavily supported by the international community. And so, so in thinking about this, um, some, some of the questions that I think those who are designing their own national dialogue have to think about when they're deciding what type of international support to, to, to receive is, will international support increase or decrease the credibility of the process? Will the reactions be different among different stakeholders? Would it be helpful for international support actors to play some roles? And should certain roles be left 
to national actors? And if there is international support, what will be the strategy to manage coordination or to delineate roles and responsibilities? Finally, we looked at the question of results and implementation. Um, the nat a national dialogue itself is a major undertaking um, that would take often weeks or months or even years. Uh, and so often uh, people get to the end of the national dialogue and think it is the end of the process. But in fact, one of the hardest steps is to, to ensure the implementation of decisions that have been made. And this really varies across, across the different dialogue processes that we looked at in terms of institutions, mechanisms, committees, and responsibilities that are established. Um, and I think one of the, the most important um, lessons that we see in here is that having clarity, um, having institutional responsibility, and also forging mechanisms to sustain political momentum and support whether it's from political leadership or pressure from civil society on implementation of, of the dialogues agreements is, is absolutely critical. So let me just um, end by, by drawing out um, a, few, a few quick points um, and recognizing that national dialogues and their design provoke some real dilemmas. Um, one, one dilemma relates to inclusion and who is part of the dialogue process itself. Often the very essence of the tensions and the conflicts and crisis in a country is a question of inclusion or exclusion. And so the national dialogue becomes the venue where, where some of this is discussed from a structural perspective, but that also relates directly to the, the political aspect of it. And I, I would point to the possibility of taking creative and incremental approaches to what inclusion can look like. Um, and we've seen this in other, in other dialogue processes. The second is the question of independence and political, political buy-in and ownership. Many people argue about the importance of independence from any, any sitting government for a dialogue to be credible. At the same time, a dialogue needs to have commitment by a sitting government as a key party uh, to be successful in going forward. And so this is really a balance um, that I think as, as we looked across the six case studies has to be calibrated over time. There's a dilemma about the scope and depth of what the dialogue will take on. And then there is um, a core challenge of navigating the preparation, the actual dialogue itself the follow up and the follow through. And so from, from the work that we've done both in this, this research and some of the, the advising um, and the accompaniment of, of national dialogue processes, we know that understanding and matching the circumstance that gave rise to the need for the dialogue with an appropriately tailored approach is perhaps um, the most fundamental uh, foundation that, that gives the greatest chance of success for a national dialogue. Um, we also know that setting realistic objectives matters. Uh, we know that monitoring and analyzing the dynamics of the conflict over time and adapting the process design as needed is, is absolutely critical. Setting a roadmap and sticking to it uh, will not necessarily result in success because we know that conflicts change over time. We know that dynamics externally change over time and the dialogue has to adapt to those as well. We, we saw that the ability to seize opportunities to skip all groups, including those previously excluded, a real voice in the discussion in decisions and implementation um, is, is a key factor. And that after the conclusion, ensuring follow through so that a seat in the national dialogue translates into inclusion in society and governance, not necessarily government, but in governance um, is incredibly important. Sometimes we get caught up on the importance of inclusion to have a seat at the table. But at the end of the day, the importance of inclusion is so that people feel that they are part of decision-making, that their lives are better, that they see themselves in the future of the country. They see the, the lives and the future of their children in, in the future of the country. And so really what, what, we, what we found in, in this work is that these processes are dynamic. There need to be on-ramps for participation, on-ramps for, for, for other options. Um, that 
the gaps, the sequencing um, are, are absolutely critical. And finally, what I'll say is that we, we know that um, from each of these six case studies, the national dialogue doesn't take place in a vacuum. Whether it succeed or not um, depends at least in part on other interconnected dialogues, consultations, negotiations, trust building that may happen before, during, or after the dialogue. Um, it would be impossible for any one process to take on the weight of addressing the past, grappling with the, the current moment, and forging a path forward for the country. And so what we really saw is that the potential of national dialogues is, is maximized when they're considered as complements to other approaches in, in peace building and in negotiation and, and in security. And that a tailored architecture of transformative processes um, that could include national dialogue as part of it um, gives the greatest chance uh, towards a step um, on the journey towards sustainable peace. So thank you for, for the interest. Um, I will put the, the link of the publication in the chat here. Uh, and I welcome future conversations um, with the Romo Studies Association and others as, as Ethiopia contemplates its, its step forward. Thank you so much. That's absolutely enlightening as we will take this project very seriously to work on a national dialogue as a primary way of to resolve the, the, the issue in the country. Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne Stegall. We'll definitely re-engage you. We'll have uh, scholars and experts read the research and maybe have a round table discussion in much more detailed uh, way as to how we can initiate and push for national dialogue in the country. I thank you for taking the, our invitation in short notice and all the work that the USIP has done and continue to do for peace and stability. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really wanna thank everybody who had worked hard to make this uh, mid-year conference successful uh, for, for coming together. And those uh, presenters also who have accepted our invitation and came on our platform to discuss some important issues that concerns the interest of Oromo. Uh, looking ahead, we are planning um, an annual conference. Date and time will be released. It's going to be in-person conference unless the pandemic becomes really bad. And so in this conference, we will be in the annual conference, we'll be focusing on not why, but how to achieve specific things that would empower the Oromo people for that, we will release a call for paper early. We are asking serious thinkers, researchers to partake in this annual conference so that we can make a difference. We can begin to revive the Oromo civilization, re-empower the, the, the young generation and assert the democracy the way it should be. And so I thank everyone and I call this mid-year 2020 Mid Year Conference to close. I thank everyone for participating, all of all, all who has helped us to get where we are. Thank you very much. <laughs>